first off, congratulations on the film. Uh, this is your first feature film. So I want to start off uh, our discussion at the beginning and ask what inspired you to focus on this topic. Uh, in 2012, uh, I was making a short film about a nonprofit that was working in Afghanistan. And I was, it was just a short, and I was handed a hard drive of footage from someone who was living there, and I had seen a bunch of uh, uncut footage of them just putting the camera in the middle of the street and pressing record. And it, that was our idea of B-roll. And it was like 20 minutes of the same viewpoint, and it just let me sit with Afghanistan for a little bit, and I never had done that before. I had only seen, you know, uh, you know, 9-11 happened when I was 16. It was just, didn't really think about Afghanistan too much, and all of a sudden I was seeing just normal everyday life, people walking down the street, drinking tea, kind of waving to the camera, and just became insatiably curious about our perception of this place and, and why we have it, and wanting to hear from Afghans. Um, and Afghan journalists and Afghan storytellers um, versus what I was used to hearing from. So in 2012, I um, emptied my bank account and sold my car for Mo and I to go there for uh, two and a half weeks or something like that, and then um, met all the journalists, and we thought it was going to be a short at first, but after we interviewed them, and even at one point in the interview with Farzana, Masood was sitting on the other side of the room, and they started to get in an argument about the future of Afghanistan. And so, and that was like a four hour interview. So it was like with, and with each of them. So um, it just became more and more clear that this was a feature length film. So we went back after raising money on Kickstarter for almost three months in the fall of 2013 and then edited all of 2014 and premiered at South by Southwest in March of this year. And as far as the four individuals who, who we see in the film, what was the process like getting to know them and how did you, become, how did you end up focusing on, on these four people and how much time did you spend with them before shooting and interviewing them on camera? Well, we pretty much interviewed them right away. Um, we didn't have a lot of time with them the first time that we met them. And so we were like, let's crash course, let's get to know them. We know their work and it's incredible. With Farzana and Masood and Najibola, we had seen their work before and then we got to know Kiel's work as well. Um, so yeah, we got to know them uh, over the course of these interviews and then really just kind of stewing with these interviews for a while and then when we w went back is where we really got to follow them again. But as far as um, access, we actually had really quick access, like the quickest I've ever had because um, Alexandria, this is our first feature length film, but we've both made shorts before this, um, and both of us in like very different contexts. And um, for me, like this, yeah, the access was so immediate. I think a lot of it was that they're journalists themselves, and so they're storytellers. They know what it means to ask someone, hey, can I follow you around? Oh, yeah, yeah, in your house, to the grocery store, almost in the bathroom, like everywhere, you know, I want to get it all. And so I think they understood um, what we were trying to do because we told them we wanted to do not just a story about them shooting or a profile piece or something, but we actually wanted to tell a story about human beings. And to expand on the topic of access, the film takes us inside locations that we might think of as quite sensitive, for instance, the hospital and, and the voting registration center. Um, wh what location where you filmed was the most difficult to gain access to, and what types of challenges did you have gaining permission uh, well, definitely the hospital because we never did gain access to that, but that was, ended up being just a great thing for the film because it shows what Farzana deals with all the time. Um, things that weren't in the film, it was actually really difficult to navigate access um, into a press pool, and Mo went to that, and it ended up not being in the film. So, like, and sometimes that happens with films where you're just like the hardest thing that you're working on ends up being on the cutting room floor. Um, but it took actually days and days of like meetings and going through hallways with papers and um, talking to different people and like um, stamps and lost papers and envelopes to even get to that hospital in the first place. So we don't show that side of thing, but Farzana was right there with us going and trying to get permission even in Kabul before we went. So it was a lot of build up even beyond what we showed to get access into that place and only to be stopped like right behind those glass windows. 
Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience in just a minute, but before I do, I, I wanted to ask if the film has been screened in Afghanistan, and if so, what, what has the reaction been and the feedback? Yeah, we have not screened the film in Afghanistan yet. Um, we're planning very carefully around how we're going to do that. Uh, the security of the subjects is really the most important thing. And of course, if we had it our way, all Afghans would see this film. But really, um, we had a really amazing, honest talk with all four of them earlier this year. They actually came to, Farzan and Masood came to our international premiere at Hot Docs. And then um, all four of the subjects were at two festivals in the United States, and we got to have a really good time just sitting around a table discussing what the ramifications of showing the film in Afghanistan were and came to some conclusions about how we're going to do that in a limited capacity in a very controlled way. So we haven't done it yet, looking into it, basically. Well, I'd like to open it up to for everyone's questions. Um, if you just raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. And before I do, if anyone in the back wants to move up to some of the empty seats in the front, please feel free. Um, so we'll start over here. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering, there's lots of um, impact of Taliban on the people, but I'm, what surprises me is it, there seems to be less of a um, perspective on the impact of American soldiers and British soldiers into Afghanistan. I'm wondering, um, while filming the four uh, individuals, do you come across any perspective on that? I, oh, is it my turn? Go we go every other one. <laughs> um, I think uh, the things that we're showing in the film are definitely what our photojournalists were following while we were following them. Masood goes on embeds, um, and it just, but it's what we, um, the topics that we chose were definitely because they were following them themselves. Um, in Kabul, it's such a, a bubble um, of Afghanistan, of, uh, you feel a lot safer in that city or used to. And I think there was only one instance where we even saw um, U.S. military. Um, yeah, they there started was a, to withdraw. Already. Yeah, there, was a very, there wasn't really many people around. And it was really odd because it was just Mo and I filming with our fixer and our driver, and we were in a little white Toyota Corolla just super low key and there was a um, a tank that had stopped traffic completely and I remember it like crossing in front of us and actually being a little terrified of it but <laughs> um, it was just a really weird feeling. Um, you can obviously feel the presence, you can see the base from Darlan Palace and you can see the blimp that's up in the sky all the time and but even in Herat and Panjshir we didn't see any um, it's just, uh, and with this film, it wasn't something that we wanted to dive into that because there's already so many great films and dive into that topic. Yeah, quite honestly, the subjects, like Alexander was saying, we were following them so closely, <coughs> and I was surprised personally that their lives weren't affected on a day to day basis by U.S. forces. Yeah, it wasn't something we talked about. However, like you do see in the current context of Kabul, a lot of the things that have gone up there, which we don't go into necessarily, um, the aid and the, the military presence. Kabul has like, you know, there's swimming pools there now. There's yeah. like indoor swimming pools and there's um, lots of fast food and there's lots of newspapers and there's like, it's blown up. So I mean, all of those things are complexly and intertwined with foreign intervention. But we did see Afghan forces a lot when we shot with them. Yeah, we bit. did, yeah. <coughs> Mostly Afghan police. I thought it was um, beautifully shot. Did you shoot it yourselves? And, and when you were filming her at the hospital, how many people were there? Because the doctor let you talk. He carried on talking for such a long time, didn't he, before he said to stop shooting and really said quite incriminating things. So I'd, I'd love to know more about the filming situation. I thought it was very, very good. Yeah, it was just um, Alexandria and I, uh, and we were the only ones shooting the entire film, yeah. Um, the sound as well. Yes, yes, just us. <laughs> And then we had an amazing driver and a translator fixer. But a lot of the Verite stuff, so for example, the hospital, um, we didn't know what was happening in real time because we don't know Dari that well. I mean, we'd learned some of it. It's a beautiful, simple language. So we were like picking up as much as we could, but we really didn't know what was necessarily happening in the hospital while we were filming it. We just knew that we had to keep rolling all the time. Um, and so only later did we really find out like the nuances of that altercation. Um, but yeah, it was just the two of us. But we got permission from the doctor before 
And then after all that happened, I ran back and got permission a second time, signature twice, because it was just like, are you okay? But sure. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think with him, it, I mean, it shows that he didn't let us in. Yeah. That's what it shows. So I think he's okay. Did he decide in advance? Did he knowing knowing what his his history with Jesus about geography? No, um, I think that really came out of um, showing Najibullah as more of a form in the film. Came a lot out of. Um, because a lot of the words that he used, like silhouette and framing, um, are English words. And so that was really inspiring, because when he would say silhouette, we just ran to the other side of the room to get him in a silhouette. Um, and I don't know, he's so wonderful about, like we'd be filming something, and we'd be filming him going down the street, and he would check our shot. And we were like, oh, just go. And he's like, ooh, leading line. Nice. <laughs> And so he was, it just, he just became that to us. It was so fun to talk to him about photography, and he's such a, a force and so well respected. He kind of just naturally became this like form in the film that guides us through. So it worked out well. I just wanted to bring the microphone to the back because I thought I saw a hand here. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, brilliant. That, I was really inspired. Amazing images. A stunning film. Um, I just wanted to ask because. You kind of get this feeling that the camera, well, your camera feels quite, uh, mostly quite sort of inobtrusive. You don't really feel that it's there that much. And I wanted to know how long it was rolling, what percentage of the footage you actually used for the film. I mean, did you just film endlessly and then sort of you cut out tiny bits, sort of the golden bits? I mean, yeah, what percent actually went into the film? So That's exactly question. what we did. Yeah. <laughs> film endlessly and cut out the golden bits. I think we should just describe <laughs> it that way. Yeah. Um, That's we all film is. It's easy. Yeah. <laughs> we were, well, because we had, we t so to go back to Afghanistan to shoot most of the film, the second time we went in 2013, we did a Kickstarter campaign, and that was paying for that shoot, and we were really, like, we had, you know, only so much money and so many so much time to be there because of money. Um, it's expensive to shoot with a fixer and a driver every day and lodging and everything. So, um, and so we were just pulling the longest days that we possibly could. It was like any downtime was like, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? And just bopping around between the four and trying to be there as long as we could when we were with one of them. And it seemed like you know things were opening up. So um, most of the, almost every scene was shot on two cameras with both of us just shooting at the same time, and I think it was, how much footage? Like 300 hours? Yeah, 300 hours of footage, so. But, you know, once you translate a lot of that, you realize how much of it is inconsequential <laughs> when they're talking about lunch or whatever, although sometimes those things are still kind of fun and you keep them in the back of your mind of how to use them. But, um, but yeah, the story, it took about a year and a half, almost, well, longer than a year and a half to edit. Um, a lot of the direction for this was, was in the edit, so it was really weeding through everything we had. And Alexandria edited, and then the uh, it was like, you know, we would do these kind of, we had so many different versions, but I think Alexandria edited enough scenes for like five films. <laughs> a lot of the scenes, you know, we were pretty relentless about like, what is this accomplishing, and is it moving things forward, and, and so things ended up on the cutting room floor for sure. Were there more questions in the back? Well, back here, and then I'll move back to the front. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask a question about the bilingual aspect of the film. I was wondering why Masood and his wife, I can't remember her name, but uh, prefer, I mean, uh, narrated their stories in English. That code switching actually had an alienating effect on me. Yeah. I don't know if they preferred it or Maybe there was a technical issue, or, or maybe it was a practical matter. Because I felt, uh, of course, it's totally <laughs> personal, but I felt the other two photojournalists who narrated their stories in their own mother tongue um, provided a more nuanced presentation of their situation. And that yeah. code switching, yeah, just alienated me from the, I don't know, like the tragic aspect of the experiences. Yeah. I'm sorry that, oh yeah, I feel bummed that it alienated you. Um, yeah, it was something that was a conversation constantly. Honestly, we, we didn't really have any uh, decision making in that process. Uh, they, preferred. They, they preferred, yeah, definitely. And actually, we would have preferred if they would have speak, spoken in Farsi because <laughs> editing English as a second language is not fun. It's not fun. Um, 
because we do feel like you can describe so much better what happens when you're speaking in your own language. But it was, um, Masood does a lot of interviews, Farzana does a lot of interviews. I mean, they're used to speaking in English. They, they work with a lot of people who speak English. Um, it's some, and Wakil, when he came to the States um, for some of the screenings, he had been working at AFP um, for, since we were there, so um, back in the fall of 2013, and he uh, now speaks English. But even when we did Q and A's, he would speak Farsi, and Masood would get frustrated with him. He's like, "Just speak English," and he's like, "No, I want to say this in Farsi," <laughs> and it's understandable. But it's understandable both ways, um, and it was something that um, we didn't have an option for, but we tried to navigate. I think this film, especially, we put a lot of time and effort into um, translations, and I think one of our translators is actually here. Is to here here? To here? Are you here? He's not here. Okay, well, There's anyway, he lives in London. <laughs> um, but we worked with three different translators, and it was something that was really important for us um, to make sure that the nuances of the language were represented as much as we could. And so we had every single sentence we've talked about for hours and hours and hours to make sure it was as much as we could um, representing what they were saying. So I hope we got it right if you speak Farsi. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, good. Then it's all correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, congratulations on the film. It's great. I actually worked at AFP in Kabul a few years ago, so it's, it's nice. quite familiar. Wow. Um, I was just hoping you might be able to talk a bit more about how you persuaded um, the women you got speaking on the film to talk, because it is such a culturally difficult thing to do in Afghanistan. How did you persuade them to well, 100% of the access to women in Afghanistan was Farzana. So Farzana has forged you know, that access with women there um, to the point where not only she gets them to talk to her, but she actually says, yeah, these two white girls are also going to film. <laughs> and then they allow us. Um, I think a lot of it was, yeah, I mean, it was Farzana. But also, if we were men, then we never would have been able to be in the room you know, and asking and not even asking questions, but just filming. There, it never would have happened. So being women ourselves was a necessity, and then the access gaining was, was on Farzana's side. I think we have time for a few more questions. Yes, on the side. Hi, um, that was amazing. Um, I'm just curious, so you were talking about being women and how you could go into these hospitals and speak to these women and they would obviously give you answers. But in terms of like walking around the streets and going to, you know, very male dominated areas, um, being both very beautiful women, how was that? Like, did you encounter any difficulties? Um, you know, like being women doing that in sort of male orientated environments? <laughs> um, understandable question. Um, Sorry, so many sarcastic things came up in my head about being a beautiful woman. It got totally in the way. They were pissed that we were pretty. Um, no, <laughs> um, no it, it was definitely, as, a, as foreign women, um, and I assume a lot of people here have been to Afghanistan in this crowd, but it's something where um, you're allowed into the room with the men because you're not held to the same standards as um, Afghan women or cultural restraints in that regard, but you're also allowed into the room with women and so for us it was um, just the, a, a great scenario and a lot of the time in Kabul I mean people are just so historically hospitable in Afghanistan you walk in and they're curious about what you're doing they're relentless they will not let you leave without drinking tea and having snacks and, um, and I think it's great Mo and I are used to working in situations where you're quickly having to make people feel comfortable and adapt and try and fall away at the same time to shoot verite and Mo walks into I think there was one situation where we were um, filming um, on the street with a bunch of police which can be kind of more dangerous for them in the sense that we make them a target just by being there and they were very serious it was really early in the morning everyone was kind of grumpy and Mo just busts out like a big smile and they like one guy just couldn't stop giggling and then it was just like over from there so um, no, we had, a, we had a great experience, but like Mo said, access was definitely because of our, um, because of the photojournalists, the local photojournalists. I think one thing too that was interesting is that sometimes 
it would change, but sometimes people thought that Alexandria was Afghan. I mean, she just has long dark hair. And for me, a, a lot of times I'm, I'm like, play the weirdo card, I guess. I'm like, yeah, I'm that foreign. Look at how crazy I look. Like people think like, what the hell is that blonde lady doing in the middle of the street here? And that can be sometimes good because it disarms people. They're like, okay, this is just kind of ridiculous that you're here. You know, they're, they're and, and in other circumstances, I'm sure it can be a, a, a target as well. We've talked a lot about that and I like never would want to put someone in danger just because I have like a blonde head or something. But for the most part, because we were shooting in a lot of like neighborhoods and uh, you know, kind of um, under the radar, people were really curious. You know, they were just curious. What are these for? What are you guys shooting? Why, why would you do that? And and they're pretty open to you. So. I just have a couple of questions I wanted to close with. Um, firstly, since since the film was finished, because I'm sure there's been a bit of time since since the edit was complete, um, have the situations of of the characters changed or what they're doing now, um, or is the the end kind of still uh, still what the situation that they're in yeah so um, well I'm sure all of you are aware more than most audiences we have that the situation in Afghanistan security wise is deteriorating so that has changed a lot of things for people and it's a lot harder I think for them to work journalists are being targeted now more than ever um, but as far as what the individual uh, photographers are doing. Um, Farzana is still working on her project where she's training people across the country and that's going really well. She's now trained dozens of people, maybe even more than a hundred people in like the provinces. So outside of Kabul, that was a big dream for her was to train a lot of people in places where you don't usually hear stories from local people. Um, so she's been doing that. Uh, she's also been covering, I don't know if you're aware too of a really awful incident that happened earlier this year where a woman named Prakunda was murdered in the streets and it was very um, brutal and awful and um, if you want to look that up to see more about it you can but uh, just to briefly say Farzana has been covering the um, the woman who was murdered they there a bunch of other women activists and just women who wanted to stand up for for Farkunda and women's rights decided to carry her coffin which was like a very like new thing no one has ever done that in Afghanistan like women protesters carrying the coffin of somebody through the streets with like wouldn't allow a man to touch her her coffin and then they did a memorial service for her um, Farzana has been covering those women and covering activists women activists in Afghanistan so her work she's been very busy <laughs> um, Masood is at a AP still um, and Wakil is at AFP, and both of them have been on multiple embeds, um, have not gone to Kunduz, where I'm sure you know the Taliban has formally kind of taken this city over, and, um, but, they, but they are on embeds all the time and looking at maybe going to Kunduz soon. Um, Najibullah still runs the journalism, photojournalism center, and continues to teach young journalists. And he actually, when he came to the United States, spent a lot of this year here in the U.S., or here in the U.S., um, just being a tourist because <laughs> he had a visa there so he stayed and met with a lot of family that he has in Canada and the United States and took some amazing photos at Niagara Falls yeah <laughs> like and all over DC and and everywhere so they've had a pretty yeah it's been a big year actually lastly I just would like to jump back to the beginning of the film when we're introduced to Ina and um, and the photographers describe their experiences studying in this group which sound very um, almost utopian and kind of this resource not only for photography but to to um, to expand their their political perspectives and their ideas of society um, how did they how were they introduced to Ina and um, what other opportunities do you think there are in Afghanistan for aspiring photographers now yeah, Ina was really amazing for them. It's been in and out of running, and um, I think now they only train uh, videographers. They don't. They no longer have the photo side. Um, Masood was pretty integral in starting it. Like, got a job with them pretty right off the bat. Um, Wakil, I think, just happened upon it. Um, Najibullah, from his filming in um, the 
middle of Afghanistan during um, the hunger, um, like the crisis that was going on and the genocide, he had a bunch of photos that were in an exhibition in um, one of uh, the professors at Ina saw that exhibition and said, you have to come to this class. So he was already a photographer, but um, he went to Ina as you know, a student to engage more in that. Um, and then Farzana just happened upon it, and she didn't know. We actually, there's a speaking of cutting room floor. There's a whole scene like talking about how she came upon um, Ina, and she didn't even know what photojournalism was. She knew that journalism was about writing, and it was interesting because Masood also started that way. He wanted to write about uh, the refugees in Afghanistan, but when he would come back, people would be like, "You're an Afghan refugee. You know, you're putting." your own opinion in this writing, and that's why I became a photographer, because he was like, no one can argue with this photo. Um, and uh, Farzana was the same way. She wanted to be a journalist, but she didn't know anything about photography. She just happened to get into the class. And I forget how many people applied, and it was only like 40 were accepted, but it was, it was a like... a couple hundred, yeah. It was a couple hundred, and only 40 were accepted. So um, I think what, what's great now is Farzana is teaching a lot of Afghans in the countryside. So outside of Kabul, I mean, her courses are amazing. We see photos all the time of her with different student groups, um, and she's such an amazing teacher. We went to a lot of her classes, um, and Najibul is doing the same thing. So it's, I think, the, the biggest forces of um, teaching Afghans photography, and that is like being done by Afghans themselves, which is pretty cool. Yeah, one thing that was awesome about Aina, but also Farzana focuses on is teaching the business side of being a photographer, which is super important because you can do a training where you teach someone how to click a camera and what aperture and shutter speed is, but in reality, like, how do they turn that into a profession is, mm -hmm. like, there's a huge gap there mm -hmm. that I feel like even we get when we are doing screenings of the film, sometimes at universities and stuff, young people are like, how do I become? It's like this, this gap between, like, what you the basics you know and how you can actually become a professional and that was a focus for Ina and that's something that Farzana does a lot with so um, hopefully with you know the internet and with even if uh, the international news agencies are shutting staff or shutting things down that the Afghans who are being who are being trained now can try to get their work out there online and try to sell their work to Getty or to these big wire agencies and yeah, make a profession out of it. Well, thank you both again so much for thank being you for here. Having um, us. I know you're probably quite busy with the film right now, but are there any other upcoming projects you're able to, to tell us about in the time being? Top secret. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. We're both um, we're both on social media though. If you guys want to follow us, uh, and the fr and frame by frame is as well. So we're posting all kinds of stuff all the time with updates. We'll have more screenings in the UK coming up. We have one with the Doc House, the Bertha Doc House. Yeah. And then we're also doing, looking at more opportunities. In fact, we have a team that helps put together some of them. So if you have a newsroom or, um, like, say you want to show it at your newsroom or at a community center or someplace like that, if you go to framebyframethefilm.com, you can request a screening and we'll, we will set it up. That's, like, what our goal is right now is to get as many of those done. We just had our premiere at the London Film Festival this last weekend, so it's now we're, like, pushing um, Europe pretty hard, so if you have any where you'd like to screen, it'd be amazing to do that. Thank you again, and thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Thank you.